Good morning. Good morning. Deacon Taylor. Good morning. Musician. Hello. Members and friends, good morning. Good morning. Excuse me. My name is Jan Beckwith. I am a member of the Greatest Ministry, and I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guests. I have no guests registered this morning, but if you are visiting with us, would you please stand at this time? Okay. Well, good morning again. I can't think of a better place for us to be this morning than in the house of the Lord, especially just before Christmas, and have this fellowship together. That's real special. Well, I don't know about you, but I always like to know what the backstory is of something. And I don't know whether you all know this, but we talked about this last week, if you were here, about the whole thing of the meaning of Christmas and when it started. Well, one of my favorite, favorite Christmas whatever that comes around this year is a Charlie Brown Christmas. I love it. I still watch it like I'm five. You know, I just love it. But I don't know whether you knew this. Charles Schultz had had a meeting with Lee Mendelson and the, sh- the show's producer and Bill Melendez, the lead animator. And they were discussing about taking out Linus's speech. Like, no, we can't have that. Too religious. And the whole thing is that Linus has to explain to Charlie Brown what the true meaning of Christmas is, which, you know, that's important. And so Melinda says, you know, it's very dangerous for us to start talking about religion now. And Schultz simply answered him by saying, Bill, if we don't do it now, who will? Hmm. They decided to keep the scripture in. And this was done in 1965. And if you close your eyes, you will remember, Charlie Brown is just so frustrated. Even Snoopy has gone and lit up the doghouse. And he's like, Hmm. doesn't anybody else know what Christmas really means? And they're on the stage, and Linus says, one minute. And he walks to the middle of that stage, and he drops his blanket And he says, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And Linus then looked at Charlie Brown and said, that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown.
Amen. At six, six o'clock. Six o'clock. Six o'clock. Come, come be a part of it. There was a great crowd on hand last month, and uh, and uh, they continue to lift that up and uh, draw it in with different uh, uh, folks who come to jam, to come and lift up music. Uh, those types of things will come and be blessed. I want to invite you to that. Also, I uh, want to remind you of our Wednesday morning 6 a.m. prayer call. And there will be a prayer call this week as well. Uh, how to get on the line is listed. Amen. Uh, so please do so. Also, I uh, want to remind you of midweek service Thursdays at 6 30 uh, p.m. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, midweek service this <coughs> week. Uh, then Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, uh, join uh, with us as Bobby Felder and friends set up and play. The music and lift up the sound and, and the joy in the sanctuary. Come and be a part of that. Uh, 7 p.m. on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, Bobby Felder and Friends. Also, this year we're going to hold our watch night service at Faith United Church of Christ. Amen. And, and let, me, let me tell you why we're doing that because remember, for the last few years, Faith did not have a pastor and they came and held their watch night service here with us as a joint watch night service. And so we're, we're reciprocating. Um, now that they have their pastor, uh, we will go to Faith United Church of Christ to have our watch night service. I will preach there. Uh, supper is at 9. Uh, and you know how that supper gets assembled. It's people bringing goodies and bringing uh, things. And if somebody needs a ride to Faith, uh, please uh, uh, let, uh, let uh, one of the deacons know. Uh, Brother Harris. We let we take the list of anybody need to rise so we can know who we need to get from here down to faith. All right, and uh, on and that's on watch night service for make sure anybody and everybody who wants to be there can be there. Uh, so uh, please let uh, Deacon Harris know. Deacon Harris, raise your hand so that everybody know who you are. If they don't know who you are, they should know who you are by now. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the trustees, I would like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a prosperous and Happy New Year. As you all are aware, we are still doing construction and we are hoping that it will come to an end in the new year. I will. And I know you, you are all praying with us that that will happen. Um, I will not say what month, okay, but we hope very soon. And if I, if I have not mentioned this before, whenever the construction is finished, our payments are, gonna, are going to increase. So having said that, we look forward to your continuing support and also increased support as we work towards paying the, the mortgage and keep up with our bills. So thank you for your faithfulness so far, and we look forward to better things in the new year. 
Thank you. Amen. And I want to, amen. Yes, give me a round of applause. And I also want to thank our trustees because they have been so vigilant uh, and, and, and so diligent in what they have been doing. And, uh, and you know, one of the things that we find out in the midst of it all, because we very often focus on the struggle. And when we focus on the struggle, we forget to see how we hope. And, and the reality is, the reality is we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're doing what we need to be doing. And, that's, and that says something about, one, the spirit of the church, but it also says something about the spirit, the love, the diligence of uh, uh, these trustees uh, who are really engaged in not just the management of money and the, and the, and the monetary affairs of the church, but really have an eye towards the spirituality of the church and what the church could be doing and should be doing. And I want to thank the trustees publicly for their faithfulness and all Amen. Amen. Let us pray together as we prepare to receive the offer.
I want to thank uh, Bonnie for blessing us this morning. Amen. Amen. And she has consistently enriched and blessed us during midweek service and also at the uh, Jamming for Justice. Uh, and that there has been, particularly at the Jamming for Justice, a whole assembly of talent that has touched each and every one of us. So I just want to. Give thanks to the Lord for you. Amen. Amen. You heard the text lifted up. I want to just uh, ask for you to join me in a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day, this time, this opportunity to examine this word, this text, and to seek out what it is that you are demanding and commanding for us to do. Lord, give us the ability not only to read it, but to perceive it, to understand it, to hold it deep in our souls. One thing is always certain, Lord, and that is that you are the potter and we are the clay. So mold and shape us as you would have us to be until we are perfectly fitted for your kingdom and able to call ourselves disciples of Jesus the Christ. Now as we come to this teaching moment, Lord, you hone it, you shape it, you develop it. You send it forth as you see fit, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to take a few moments to speak on the subject Pregnant with hope. Pregnant with hope. And I got to admit, just to be honest, I always have some problems with the Christmas story and the nativity of Jesus and the way it's told. And not only the way it's told, but what we choose to focus on in the telling of the story. We, we, we focus on those things that are Nice things that don't trouble our spirit, uh, things that allow us to keep it on a superficial level, uh, rather than to dive into all of the implications in the text and all of the meaning and dynamics of the text, and 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 we 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 approach it in such a way that we want to keep it light. And there's a temptation to want to keep it light because we hear stories of angels speaking to women and men, songs being raised to the highest heavens, babies being born, everybody loves a baby being born, a star marking the place where A miraculous birth took place so that the place is known. A woman beyond childbearing age becoming pregnant. Her husband in disbelief. And a teenage girl being impregnated by the influence of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, Advent Christmas is loaded with incredible stories of miracle and wonder where the doubtfulness of men and women is challenged by the incredible proclamation of angels, the Spirit, 
and of God. If you think about the elements are there, uh, you can almost hear yourself saying, once upon a time, as if it's a bedtime story, as if it's a story seeking to try to find a happy ending where they all lived happily ever after, where there's royalty and angels and proclamation and all kinds of joy that are lifted up. We are all filled with the beauty and the joy of this season. I I, I think about it, sometimes I just drive around the streets and take a look because there are lights surrounding us and flashing with reds and blues and greens. There are electronic icicles dripping its light that never touches the ground. There are inflatable Santa Clauses Angels that are illuminated, placed on lawns. Christmas trees, real and artificial. There are reefs. And there are mistletoes. All of the things that remind us of the joy and silliness of the season. One of my favorite hymns of all time is Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer Coming Home from Our House Christmas Eve. Then there is the famous and the holiest of Christmas carol that proclaims, I saw mama kissing Santa Claus. Now all of these songs are on the secular side. And yet there are songs of holy night, silent night, or O little town of Bethlehem, or O holy night, go tell it, On the mountain. We know that it is the season of joy because of the music on the airwaves and the desire of news cycles to try to find feel good stories and make a season of joy and light that attempts to push back at the darkness and the depression of the season. I'm reminded that there is something deeper in the story than just the sound of angels' voices or shepherds watching their flock by night. Now, I'm going to tell you after having been Israel, Palestine, and December, it's cold. Them shepherds were cold, y'all. In fact, when I was there two years ago, there was remnants of snow on the ground. It's cold. So I thought about those shepherds watching their flocks by night. And I thought about that wind whistling around them as well. But we make it sound kind of nice that they're out watching their flocks and they see this proclamation. And what I'm getting at here is that we love the joy of the season. Why shouldn't we? We love incredible nature of the story, and why shouldn't we? We love the lights and the Christmas parties and the presents given and those under the tree. It is Advent. And there are these themes symbolized through candles that are lit, such as hope and Faith and joy and peace and Christ. We come to December. It should be no mystery to us. We come to December as the days grow shorter until the winter solstice, where the days grow longer, and it is also a time of year where Christmas and Hanukkah falls. And that is not coincidental. It's seasons that are celebrating the elongation of the days. Light coming into the midst of the world. Joy coming into the midst of those times of depression in our soul. You know, uh, it, it, it is very clear to us in terms of, in terms of medical science that there is depression in that as the days go on. That there's a, a sense of hopelessness that can set in as the things grow dark. And here we are, talking about the 
talking about light in the midst of darkness. Talking about joy in the midst of a season of sorrow. In a season of depression. So you can look at it this way that really our celebration is a defiance to the engulfing of darkness and the surrounding of us in sorrow. It's a defiance to it, saying, no, no, light has come into the world. No, no, in spite of it all, I choose to have joy and celebrate. Advent Christmas confronts the seasonal darkness and the onslaught of depression that comes with the season. Advent Christmas challenges the darkness of the world and the sorrows of life with a determinate defiance to that darkness and those sorrows. So we read words in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3, like this. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. We discover in the Advent Christmas stories and, and words that, that, that ruminates the meaning of these births, the birth of John, the birth of Jesus, what they will challenge. What difference will they make coming into this world? And how will life be changed because of their coming, because of their appearing? But if you notice in the text... The birth of John and Jesus, though they are miraculous occurrences for the mothers who will bear them and for the parents who made or reared them, yet the preponderances of the statements concerning these births is about the difference they will bring into the world and into our lives. It's not necessarily about they being born. It's not about the mothers. It's not about the fathers. It's about what difference is going to be made by these lives coming into the midst of the world. For example, in Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, it says about John, He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and the power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Even Mary, when reflecting upon the birth of her son Jesus, sings out, In Luke chapter 1, verse 51 to 55, he has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. You see what I'm getting at? It's about making a difference in the world. It's about bringing light into the darkened places of existence and lifting us out of the places of hopelessness and, the dep- and depression, as we read, the Son of God will scatter the proud, bring down the powerful, lift up the lowly, fill the hungry, and send the rich away. Jesus is to be the, unfulfill- the fulfillment of the yet unfulfilled promise of God in history. You, you, you see what I'm getting at? Is that, is that yes? Christmas and Advent is rhythm with ribbons and bows. And it's packages and it's dressing up in Christmas colors. Yes, it's that, but it's also deeper than that. Yes. We hear in these words that the impact of these lives upon the world is going to change the course of history in the world. Yes. And not only change the course of history in the world, but change our outlook on life. To bring some difference into the world, to impact 
the world in the way in which it had not yet been impacted, to bring joy into the midst of sorrow, to bring light into the midst of darkness, to bring mercy into the midst of callousness, to teach us a few ways. These lives, these lives are, are defined not by how big they might grow or what office they might achieve in life or even how far they might go educationally. It has no bearing upon that. It simply basically said that these who are born, John will lead the way and then Jesus will come and show the way for all of us to proceed in the walk of salvation and the walk of healing, and the walk of wholeness, and the walk of liberation. It's about making a difference in the world. As we read in the text, Mary greets Elizabeth, and the baby leaps for joy in the womb of Elizabeth. In other words, the power of God and the hope of God is even recognized by a child yet unborn. And why can't you see it? If it's recognized by a child yet unborn, why don't you see what that baby in womb could see? Mary and Elizabeth are both carrying in their womb. If you look at their words, the hope for the world. They're carrying in their womb the hope for the world. Each of these children are born, if you think about it, into humble circumstance. Yes. To humble women. Not into rich families and yet the promise is that a great impact will be made upon the world and upon you and upon me. This is why we end up singing with gusto joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks and hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nation prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. We sing because it is our resistance to the sorrows of life. It is our resistance to the troubles of life. It is our resistance to life's oppressions. The birth of John and the birth of Jesus reminds us that the power and presence of God can also come from any place, in any form, from any neighborhood, at any time. John and Jesus remind us that God is accessible and very near to me and you. The birth of John and the birth of Jesus clearly inform us that in the birth of a boy or a girl, from any family, from any neighborhood, from any country, just might be the birth of God into our world. Just think of it. If, 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 if God exists as a continuum, you know what I mean when I say that? We want to fix God very often back there. You know, I hear people talk about the olden times. I have no idea what they mean by olden times. But, 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 but they want to fix God back there. Yes. And say, therefore, what has happened has happened. And, and it's already happened. It can't happen anymore. Well, that's false. What you look at. 
don't you understand what God is demanding and commanding of us? A voice emerges. Light in the midst of darkness. Joy in the midst of sorrow. God speaks to us in the midst of it all. Elizabeth, who was barren, is pregnant. And Mary, young and poor, is also pregnant. John will prepare people for the coming of the Lord. And Jesus is the presence of God. This season and at this Advent Christmas, I want to suggest to us that there is a pregnancy of hope. And we need hope and light at this time in this country, in this city, in this metropolitan area, and in this world. With the government shut down over a draconian policy of a border wall, the turmoil that is sweeping the country, the political scandals and the wars in the world, we need hope and light at this time in this world, in our lives. I need some hope and light just to get up in the morning and to be able to be fueled by that hope and light. It is obvious that political leaders only bring, I'm going to say this, only bring political turmoil. So we need a hope that is higher than the nonsense in the White House or in Congress. We need hope as the investment markets plummet because of the angst and worries that have been precipitated by sheer recklessness and chicanery and calm. We need this moment to be pregnant with hope and possibilities. This pregnancy means that hope is being carried. Hope is developing and maturing. And through though it is and, 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 and though it is coming into the world, it's not here yet. Y'all, y'all know what it is when you're when you're pregnant. I know I, I, I can't talk about being pregnant, but you know what I'm saying? I know what it is to be pregnant. And, and, and you know, you know that when you're pregnant, yes, you, you, you're filled with the presence of a child that is not here yet. It, it, it's got to be born yet, right? But the water of life has to break yet. You have to give birth yet. And everything that a mother does is to prepare uh, for the coming of that child. Right? So in a sense, you know, as, as our time is pregnant with hope, we, we got to prepare for the coming of that child. How do you prepare for the coming of that child? Well, a mother goes and, and basically will set up some type of version of a nursery. Right? Mother will even think about what types of clothes that a child could wear. All those other types of things to get them, get ready, get ready in their household, get ready in their spirit for the coming of that child. So when that child is here, that child has everything that that child needs in order to come forth into fruition in the world. So as the people of God, we come, we, we, we are pregnant with hope. Yeah. Men, you're pregnant with hope. Go and tell somebody I'm pregnant with hope, men. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't put it that way because, you know, very often we, we sort of leave that whole idea, that whole conceptualization up to women. But we, if we believe in God, then we are also pregnant with hope and pregnant with the possibilities of this time and pregnant with expectation. We're waiting for the Savior to come into our lives. We're trying to get ourselves ready, our world ready to bring light into the darkness and joy into the sorrow to lift somebody up and to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. We need to have that hope. That hope. Because the other thing that that hope does, it doesn't allow me to fixate on the madness of the world. The world is mad. That person who is a tenant in the White House is mad. 
But I don't need to focus there. I need to focus on what God is going to do. What God is about ready to do. How God is going to break through. I need to function and move with the full expectation that there is pregnancy and there is hope and joy that the world is pregnant with and God's presence is about to break into this world. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let all receive her king. Joy in the midst of sorrow and light in the midst of darkness. And let us sing a song of hopefulness and light and empowerment and joy. Let us be expectant of this baby coming into our midst on this day. Let us get ready for it. Amen. 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 Pregnant with hope. The doors of the church are open. I pray you find prepare to adjourn from our worship this morning again to be reminded of Jams for Justice and also be reminded of Bobby Felder and friends on December 24th at 7 p.m. and let us go and let us be engaged in a wondrous celebration of the birth of Jesus. Oh, Lord, let us go forth from here as the bearers of light. Let us carry that light into the midst of the world. Let us take some joy into the midst of the world, Lord. Let us bring some hope into the midst of the world, Lord. Let us be the ones that teach those who are almost ready to give up that there's no time to give up. It's time to embrace, to embrace the birth of a Savior who brings hope and joy into the midst of this world. In all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the Father, we pray, amen. Amen.